Um, I'm Kathleen Stone, and I'm the Director of Curriculum and Instructional Design at SUNY Empire State College. Um, and I'm one of the many people who are working through the development and then the facilitation of this MOOC. And today I have two people with us who are going to talk to us about um, uh, assistive technology and some of the benefits and pitfalls with that as well. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves and, and, and give brief bios on who they are. So how about, uh, John, would you like to go first? Sure, I'd be glad to. My name is John Cragness, and I'm currently the Director of Disability Services for M State, the Fergus Falls campus here in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. And I've kind of been on both sides of the assistive technology, uh, both as a consumer and as a, as a provider. Uh, I was first injured in a diving accident back in 1987. I was left uh, C5-6 quadriplegic. And so when I was uh, had gone through rehab, I was really, almost, I would describe it almost as assaulted with assistive technology devices. Uh, there's a lot of great things that are out there, thank goodness for them, they can do some, some magical things. Uh, but I found judicious use of those uh, technologies was really very, very valuable. Um, as I kind of worked my way through, I found things that were valuable, things that weren't valuable. And I've been able to take and transition that now from a not only a consumer standpoint, but also to a provider standpoint working in the college environment where I'm at now. And so I'm kind of a minimalist. I want to find things that are mo the most readily available so that there's the least reliance on really highly specialized things when possible. Uh, but once we find those things, they're sometimes high tech, sometimes low tech, but just finding what's really practical and really fits the need of the individual rather than just a lot of fancy new stuff. Excellent, thank you. And um, I also have Claudette with us. And so Claudette, could you give a, a little bio on yourself? Sure, I'm Claudette Peterson. I'm on the faculty in the School of Education at North Dakota State University. My area of interest is adult learning and I teach in a, a doctoral program in adult and occupational ed. Uh, John was actually my advisee when he was in his doctoral program and he provided me some great learning experiences. I had made an effort in my teaching at now three land grant universities to provide um, the kind of support that learners with different challenges needed in my classes. And it was always a frustration to me that when I would contact the Office of Services for Students with Disabilities, they never had anything to offer. I wanted specific tips and hints and suggestions. I've asked major universities and I never got any help. I was told, well, if they need a note taker, we can do that. But nothing to help me set up my classes. Working one-on-one -on -one with John, I learned a whole lot more than I ever learned from one of those offices. So we decided to try to share what each of us have learned. Uh, as John said, he comes at it from two different perspectives now, a provider as well as someone who benefited from the services. And I am coming at it as the instructor. All right, excellent, thank you. And that was uh, the, one of the reasons I, I was really um, excited to have you both here is because of that partnership of how you, the two of you have worked together. Um, so I have two very uh, uh, straightforward questions for you. The first one is, why is education important for a growing number of individuals with disabilities? Um, so whichever one of you would like to try to take that one first. Well, and maybe I'll go ahead and start off with that, if that's okay. Uh, you know, I think that a lot of what happens when you look at, especially some of the economics, uh, independence, uh, and being able to try to find ways to level the playing field, you know, education really becomes a, a tool to make that happen. Uh, we're seeing a lot more numbers. You know, we've got returning vets that have been injured uh, overseas. You know, and we've got things, um, you know, you look at poverty, and of course, poverty can lead to disability because you don't always have the same tools and resources. Um, that would be available to somebody else. Also, um, disability can lead to poverty because you lose that ability to make the, uh, the same income and have the same opportunities. Um, you know, for myself, I know that I was, you know, working labor jobs and that sort of thing. It was really a uh, disability that brought me to education because I had, had no other way to really be competitive anymore in the workplace. And I had to find an entirely new way to do that. Uh, I know I had also taught uh, computer science for a number of years in the college setting. A lot of the students who had come in were there because they needed to learn new skills. And it's really about offering that opportunity. Right now, there's about one in five people in the U.S. that are diagnosed with some sort of a disability. We've just had the, uh, the DSM-5 released, and I think they're looking at some of the new diagnostic criteria, some of that's beginning to shift a little bit. And also with the reauthorization of the ADA, 
they really redefine, I shouldn't say redefine, they've clarified what the original intent was as far as defining what is a disability and it's really kind of broadened um, what had become a very narrow definition. And as those things happen, I think that's gonna lead more people to come to see us in higher education to create those new opportunities and try to re-establish that a little more level playing field. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Claudette, did you have anything to add? Uh, my response is beyond just people with disabilities, everybody has to be a lifelong learner if they're going to stay functional in our current world, whether they're taking care of their own health issues by checking things online or trying to maintain their employability. But yes, that's magnified an order of magnitude for people that are dealing with disabilities. Uh, like John, I have a real interest in military personnel who are returning with injuries they have GI Bill benefits that they want to use and um, the challenges and barriers. And it's only from working with John that I've really learned how extensive some of those barriers are and what I can do as an instructor to work with that. All right, thank you. Um, the other question I have, it really is about the assistive technology. So could you describe how technology and um, assistive devices uh, can create a challenge possibly? You know, maybe the benefits and challenges to using them. Well, maybe I'll, uh, if that works, I'll just begin uh, with some of that. Uh, you know, the assistive tech, I, you know, I live on assistive tech every single day. Uh, thank goodness for it. I uh, uh, wrote my dissertation largely through voice recognition software. Um, you know, my vehicle is, is highly modified so that I'm able to drive it. Um, there's a whole host of things I use every day. So many, I, I, I often forget that they're even assisted devices. Uh, even my cell phone runs a lot of my, you know, everything from HVAC, my home to home theaters to TVs. To, uh, it's, it runs my car, for goodness sakes. Um, you know, so there's a lot of those that are really great technologies, very useful. But some of the pitfalls we can run into are what happens when those technologies fail us? or when they conflict with other things. And that really gets to be a big issue, especially in the educational environment, because if you're working on your own, it's one thing where you can choose what device you're going to use. Once you reach someplace, say, uh, say it's a course or, or something where a student is required to complete a certain task, that means that their assistive tech is then going to have to work with whatever it is that they are completing. Take, for example, a math program when a student uses JAWS or some other kind of a reader uh, maybe with, you know, low vision or blind student. And oftentimes those programs are not accessible and they don't work with those softwares. I've seen cases where they'll require students to buy the latest, greatest software at very expensive. The students got to learn how to use a new software, you know, where they weren't necessarily comfortable with the new stuff. They, they were working with the old stuff and they get all done. It still doesn't work. Uh, very frustrating, you know, for students because it's, it's a lot of change and all of a sudden you've got the learning curve beyond the classroom and the disability they're already dealing with. Um, there's a whole host of those things. Uh, even when I go to load software back on my computer for some of the devices I use, um, oftentimes I'll have to load, load, and reload, just trying to get devices to work together so that you know, there's not a, uh, a software conflict or who knows what. Some of them may require you to buy the latest version frequently. Um, and even then, it's, it's a hit and miss many times. So it just really depends. It's, it's wonderful stuff when it works, but it creates a whole lot of challenges uh, that sometimes are unexpected. And Claudette, could you maybe talk about your experiences with uh, being you know, a faculty member and, and how, you're, how you approached assistive technology and what your thoughts were and how they may have changed? <laughs> they certainly have changed because when I started working with John, uh, I had the naive assumption that, well, there's technology and assistive devices, so that solves the problem. So people with disabilities can perform successfully in classes. I was very naive about that, and it's only in getting to know John and working with him one-on-one -on -one that I became aware of those challenges. Um, aside from the fact that the software and devices don't always play nicely together with each other, which was a real shock to me, uh, we have to be careful about assumptions we make about the people that are using them. When John talked just now about loading and reloading software onto his computer, I, I flash back to three or four times where he's told me he has had to completely rebuild his computer software. And I think about it as someone who's fairly able-bodied myself, for someone who's quadriplegic, I 
it boggles the mind. How does he manage to load CDs and things like that into his computer over and over and over? So making assumptions about a user's challenges is something I would encourage people to guard against. Very personally, I made an assumption about John working on his dissertation. I thought with the requirements of APA formatting for someone who doesn't have good use of arms and hands, that that would be an impossible task. Well, silly me, what I've learned is John is very good at using his assistive technology to do that APA formatting. But I had made an assumption, and before we were at that stage, I actually called our university's grad school and office for services for students with disabilities to see what kind of help is available. Well, John doesn't need help with that, but there are other things that would be very helpful to him. So what I have asked John several times is basically, may I ask you a question and then go from there and find out what people need rather than deciding I know what they need. There are some things I can do that are helpful to John and there are others that he does very well on his own and it's insulting to assume he needs to have someone do it for him. As an instructor, something I have started doing is providing materials in different formats. Uh, at first, that seemed like a burden to me, not working with John because I never had him in a class. I was his dissertation advisor. But now I've become much more embracing of the idea of if I want to do a syllabus that's full of pictures to make a point, I also create one that is just plain text so that someone who needs to be able to scan it and listen to it can also use that without the hindrance that any fancy stuff I put in my syllabus may cause. So providing things in a written format, in an audio format, and I don't do fancy audio, I may use my smartphone to record something and send it out, but even if it's an announcement on my Blackboard site when a new course is starting and I want to put out a welcoming announcement, I will do it in writing. I also record a video and put out there or just audio. And once I got over myself, I found that that's not really a burden at all. It takes a little time more, but because I'm not trying to do it as though I'm George Lucas <laughs> doing a major production, I can do it quickly and easily. And I would encourage instructors to start using some of the technology themselves just so they can see what it's like. A couple of examples I would mention, I have a colleague who lives on a farm about an hour's drive away from our campus. So he spends a lot of time behind the wheel of his truck. He also teaches doctoral students, so he has hundreds of pages of dissertations to read. He scans those pages and then has software that reads it aloud to him while he's driving to and from work. Saves him a lot of time, and it also has given him a real awareness of what it's like to use that software. I'm recording more audio and using it to send feedback for students, and I found out that's a, a good assistive technology for me because I can do it so quickly. If I'm reading a paper, I can pick up my smartphone record some comments while I'm sitting in line waiting for the ATM and send it off to them. They get to hear my voice, the inflection of my voice, and I'm becoming more comfortable over time with using the technology. I think those are really um, wonderful examples, Claudette, and some of the things that some of the, the participants in the, of this MOOC will learn about ways that they can do such things. Um, and I think you're exactly right. The more you use them, the, you're right. They don't have to be uh, George Lucas quality, um, it, but it does help. And um, we will also talk about universal design for learning and ways that, that utilizing some of those techniques um, are important and why it is important to, to try to make your courses, especially if you're doing something online, to make sure that those materials are as accessible as you can make them from the beginning so that it is uh, um, you know, more, more accessible for students who you may not have to make as many accommodations then on the other side if what you've done is already accessible to start. 
So. Yes. And I have been frustrated that my university didn't provide me much information on the how-tos of universal design. So when you said this MOOC was being created, this course was being created, I think it's great so that we can learn from other instructors what they're doing, what tools they're using, how to make it easier. Yeah. And I think, too, that it's it's I'm glad to see that, uh, I know at least in our region, there's been a lot more movement to try to make this information more available to instructors, professors, um, so that they've got those tools available, like you said, so that when they get ready to design a course, it's it's exponentially more difficult and expensive to redesign a course than it is to just simply include it in the first place. You know, take, for example, captioning videos, um, you know, by choosing materials that are already captioned, uh, it generally there's, there's an equivalent uh, material available but if we go out and if we need to caption uh it's quite an extensive process by the time we have to go and get uh it's considered a substantial change that works we've got to get releases from where we created the video then we've got to uh, have it captioned then we've got it can take months and, and it's a very long arduous task if we can simply include already captioned works we we can avoid that whole issue Yes, exactly. And, um, and we also try to encourage people when they do create their own videos, even if they're short little videos, to have a script, because then it is easier to caption that if you have a script to begin with. Yeah. In the past, when I have taught undergraduates in larger classes at other universities, I did a lot of narrated PowerPoints. You know, now I might use Camtasia, for example, rather than just PowerPoints. But either way, I learned very quickly that I needed to have a script. And that wasn't for accessibility or use universal design purposes. The first time I did one, I recorded an entire lesson on PowerPoint with just one audio file. Well, teaching in a college of business at the time, I needed to update material. I had to re-record the entire PowerPoint. So I learned, for example, to record one PowerPoint slide at a time and have that be a standalone file, which made updating easier. But if you have a script and you have to update, it's just so much easier to do. And if you have the script, then you have it in written text that can be also provided, like on your Blackboard site, you can make it available, and audio for people who, who can't see what you're doing on the PowerPoint. So it really is not as much extra work as I perceived that it was going to be. It's just kind of good practices. Right. It's a different approach. You know, something else I think that bears mentioning is that, you know, we talk about the number of people that have got disabilities and those that are coming to higher ed. And we're talking about largely those that have been diagnosed. And a lot of the people that may be coming to see us may not be carrying a diagnosis with them, or they simply may not seek out our service, even though they could benefit from it. Um, and I think to be aware of that through universal design, you can't accommodate everything. There are some things that, that you will not be able to do. But I think that by, by recognizing that, we can address many of those needs in the early stages up front. Um, you know, I think, too, that it, a lot of the disabilities that are more challenging for people to accept and understand are those that are not visible. I mean, it's very easy to see someone in a wheelchair, to see somebody without an arm. I know as a provider, I very rarely see those students come see me. The ones that all come have come in to see me might have some kind of a psychiatric uh, um, uh, concern. They may have uh, a learning disability. It could be a dyslexic a disability. It could be a, a whole host of things that, that you just can't see. And oftentimes people will say, well, why don't you just, you know, as opposed to provide service like we would for somebody where you could have a, a visible disability. And I think that why, why don't you just attitude really is, is difficult for many students because it, it leaves them feeling like they're asking for something that others believe they don't deserve. Um, you know, it could be somebody with a heart condition that takes a handicapped parking spot and people are upset because they get out of their car and, gee, they look fine. Well, but they're not maybe fine. They really, really need that. It's important and it really matters. That's um, a really good point. We actually have a, a section that people will be be working on in the course that talks about invisible disabilities um, because that's been a concern that I've had. I've seen a lot of, especially the handicap parking spots, I've seen a lot of backlash against people um, because of that. People assume that they can't, if they don't see that somebody has a physical disability, that they don't deserve that spot. Um, and I think that's, you know, those are a, a good example of, of areas where as a society, we need, to, we need to get the word out and we need to rethink how we are approaching these, these topics. 
and even people who aren't experiencing a disability due to a sudden traumatic accident, such as John experienced, people that are aging who have changes in their physical abilities, they may require some accommodation, but with that need for lifelong learning, quite often they are taking classes. Maybe they're taking free classes at a university, not for credit, or maybe they're trying to retool themselves to stay employable. So that's another audience that can benefit too. Um, I would also encourage instructors to be aware that the challenges with technology are not limited to pieces of software or devices that a student might use in class. Again, I have learned from John, he just mentioned that he has a, an adapted van. And uh, if I had not worked with John, I would be unaware that that's a process that can take years from start to finish. And that's technology that doesn't always operate well. You and I met at a conference where John and I were presenting. You probably don't know this. He was unable to leave the conference because of a problem with his vehicle. Air travel is terribly inconvenient, but he has been trapped in that vehicle where the automatic doors won't open. And someone might be trying to come to a class, but be stuck in the parking lot. That would never have crossed my mind before. Our university has handicapped parking spots, accessible parking spots, let me rephrase that. And aside from the challenges with people uh, who don't need them using them or things like that, Ours have just changed so that you have to pay to park and you have to go to another place in the parking lot and enter money into some kind of box. For a quadriplegic person, that's challenging to do, especially in a cold, bitter winter like we might be having here. So the ripple effect of that disability and the types of technology and assists that might be needed it goes far beyond what I had ever realized. You know, and I think too that I would add to that, that, you know, I'll, every once in a while, I'll get uh, some pushback from instructors that may believe that somebody's getting an advantage in some way. And when a student's retired education, our obligation is not to give advantage, but to try to remove the barriers that are created by disability. And even in the process of trying to remove the barriers that we can, there are a myriad of barriers that exist outside of that classroom that we, you know, can't necessarily accommodate. As you mentioned, the, uh, you know, leaving the conference, it was a cascade of events because somebody had parked illegally uh, next to me. I couldn't enter my vehicle that set up a cascade of events. And, and I spent almost a, well, much of, a, much of the next week stranded in Oklahoma City. It was all, it had all begun just from somebody parking a little bit too close in, in a legal area. I mean, they shouldn't have parked there. I should have been fine, but it wasn't. And they did, and that's just how it was going to be. Yeah, and those are definitely things that I don't think um, most people would think about or consider that that, that sort of thing can happen. Right. Well, um, I really appreciate the fact that both of you took some time out to talk with me today. And I, I want to just ask if you have anything else, any last minute comments uh, that you'd like to add for the people taking this course? Well, I, I think I would just, uh, I would probably go back and, and reinforce the notion that if, if we live, you know, disability is not something that happens to others. I would say that if we live long enough, we'll experience it. If we don't experience it, it's unfortunate we didn't live that long. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, really, it's something that's not an us and them. It's all of us. We're in this together. Um, being proactive is very, very valuable, very useful. Uh, if they don't have the resources available, um, a little bit of time to seek them out somebody's got them. The trick is to find them. Uh, hopefully the college or university or wherever they are working has got some of those resources available. Uh, and again, uh, you know, are reminding those um, of those disabilities you can't always see and those things that take place beyond the classroom. And I would just add that I had it very easy working one-on-one -on -one with John, even though we were often at a distance and using Skype technology to speak to each other. I got one-on-one -on -one lessons from him. If I were still teaching large classes of undergraduates or even graduates, I wouldn't have that ability to invest all that time. But there are so many things I can do trying to use universal design that whether it's just a difference in learning style or a dramatic disability, 
I can improve that teaching learning transaction for a lot of learners in the class. And it's, I think it's worth investing that time because it, it is not that onerous. Yeah, great, great uh, closing points from both of you. So again, I thank you so much for, for doing this with us. Um, and I, I, appreciate, um, I appreciate it tremendously. Thank you, Kathleen. Great, right, thank, right, thank you. You bet.